I'm the coach of Magnus Carlsen, who is now the chess world champion and has been it since 2013. And I'm basically responsible for all his chess preparation, which means, uh, well, anything that's to do with computers. I mean, we use a lot of computer power to sort of, um, well, prepare him for his world championship matches, for his tournaments. Uh, and basically, obviously, we are supposed to be cutting edge. When you work for the world champion, you're supposed to sort of use all the best technology at hand. And that's basically what I thought we were doing. But I will go to a day in December 2017. I was in London with him. He was playing something called the London Chess Classic. He might be asleep at the point, but I'm sitting in the morning preparing uh, sort of the upcoming game that day with the technology we have. I've used something called Chess Space and especially a chess engine called Stockfish, which is, for all we know, the absolute best. Then, um, well, this company here, D uh, DeepMind, put out an academical paper and says, actually, we created a, an engine that's just completely trash Stockfish. And, well, you can understand that for us it's kind of um, shocking. Well, I gave, I think BBC asked me for a comment and I said something like this. I mean, and that's exactly, exactly how it felt, right? I'm working for the best in the world. I'm using the highest ranked software. It's really supposed to be absolutely the best of human knowledge and AI. We use this to prepare the best player in the world. It shouldn't get better than that. And then they publish a paper where you can see exactly the tools we are using is just getting completely trashed by something. Um, we're not talking about that they win marginally. It's basically like, let's say, Barcelona playing a weaker team. I mean, we're talking beautiful goals, a lot of, I mean, a huge score, just a big difference. And, well, you understand, when I wake up in the morning, I think Stockfish, this is the absolutely highest authority there is in the world. And then suddenly, two hours later, you can just see that one getting completely crippled by some kind of new technology. I understand this is made in London, but in sort of in Google's offices, but for us, it felt basically like something coming from... Uh, out of space. I have never heard about it before. And just like this, suddenly it was there. And suddenly, well, the way I, I believe things to be has been completely changed. Um, anyway, that hopefully we'll get back to in the end. But this is going to be the start of that sort of, well, how AI suddenly can come and say, OK, everything we thought about as humans, well, it's not as good as we might have thought. Anyway, there's a long uh, walk to that. But I'm going to talk about sort of the development of AI in games. I will start with all the, the trivial games, and hopefully in the end we'll end up to the, the most complex ones like chess and Go. Um, we're going to start down in the toys department. Uh, this is a game called Tic-Tac-Toe, or in Danish Krusser or Boll. Um, it's a very simple game. I think um, basically when I was in third grade in school, we had a competition, and I knew how to play it, so did someone else, so it's always a draw. Um, I read about it yesterday on the strategy. There's actually strategy on, on these things in the internet. It's, I'm going to do a very short uh, strategical lecture, lecture. If your opponent puts, starts in the corner, you put it in the middle. And if your opponent starts in the middle, you put it in the corner. This is all you need to know. Then you are basically an expert in, in this game. It's extremely simple. You don't need AI to solve it. You can take a piece of paper, and I think you will solve it in, in, in half an hour or less. This is basically a kid's game. You will find it in the, the toy store. This game, Connect 4, or Fie Postrebe for Dansk, is also a kid's game. I mean, again, if you go to the toy store, they will have tons of these games. But this is a much, much more complicated game. Actually, uh, believe it or not, in November 1988, there was basically a race to solve it. And within 14 days, two persons put out a PhD on the subject of Connect 4. Uh, I don't know if that's a very relevant subject to do. A, 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 PhD on, but there was two people actually doing it. And, um, well, very interesting paper where they, they are solving it. It's, still, it's actually too complex to solve with the computer technology at, the, at that time. So they had to, well, by brute force, meaning mapping it out. I think there is maybe like seven trillion different positions, surprisingly, in, in this one that you have to analyze. So what they did was that they actually defined nine strategic principles. And based on that, with computers, they mapped out and they proved that um, this, this game is a force to win for the player who starts. Um, well, let me actually show it if we look at, at this screen. I mean, this is a game that just has been completely solved. Um, well, you can just, I, I just Googled Connect 4 solved, and you can see how this is. And basically, well, this is an example of a solved game. If you look at uh, the screen, right, it gives thumbs up, oops. Thumbs up which means if you play this move, you're winning. If you can see neither thumbs up or thumbs down, it means the game is a draw. And if you take the thumbs down, it means if you put it there, you're going to lose. 
this is just a, a solved game. There's nothing less to discuss about this game. You, we just simply, by now, the computers has mapped everything. But in 1988, it was still too early for computers, so there was people defining strategic, strategy, um, sort of strategic ideas, and then making a PhD where they mapped out the game. And I think, well, for someone like me who spent all my uh, life on games, that I really like the title of the PhD. I think it is. Uh, Game solved, wife wins, end of story. But basically, well, some guy called Victor Ellis spent a lot of time on, on solving this game. Um, at this point, the game was what we called weakly solved, it means that they have proven that white is winning, but they haven't mapped out everything. Now, with the present level of computer power, you can see it's easy to construct something like this, where you can just see that, well, if we put it here, and again, you can see, well, whatever he does loses. If he puts it in the middle, you get it again, you have one move that's winning. If you put it in the middle, thumbs up, all the rest is losing. And then you get a lot of facts like that, and then you can try and sort of build on some strategic uh, things. Anyway, this is, um, again, in the kids' department. If we move, well, we're actually still gonna be in the kids' department. We're moving to more complicated games, a game of Scrapple. This, I would assume, a lot of you has played, right? Does anyone have an idea why computers are good at Scrabble? It's a trick question, but... Uh, Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, that's the obvious answer. And surprisingly, it's basically wrong. Of course, they have a dictionary, but actually, human players, they say, it's not that difficult remembering 50,000 words. Uh, I haven't, can't verify that myself, but they say, of course, they have a dictionary, and they are slightly better than that. Where they actually make a difference is sort of in, uh, let's say, strategic understanding or calculations. And, um, but I would have said exactly the same like that. It was just for sort of illustrative purposes. Um, this is from 1998. There is a prestigious match where the computer program at that point called Maven is playing against Adam Logan in a sort of, well, human against the machine confrontation. And this, we will discuss several games in that context. This one is, is Scrabble. You can see the computer has just, oh, sorry, the human has played lay here. I didn't know that was a word. Anyway, um, the, now Maven is to move and it's actually a, quite an interesting and difficult Scrabble pr uh, problem. To sort of understand the, the complications, you see, well, what we would look at as a human, at least I would do, I would look at the board, right? Uh, you can see all the sort of letters are there, and the letters I have is on the right side here, tiles on the rack. I have a question mark, which means I can play whatever move uh, letter I want, and then I have the other letters. And what is also extremely important to look at is the score here. Maven is 330 and uh, Logan is 403 points. So you are heavily behind. Um, well, what would be a logical move for Maven to make here, you would think? I don't know if anyone plays Scrabble. At least my idea when you play Scrabble is to try to find, well, I'll try to find as long a move as possible. I will try to make as many points as possible. That would be sort of a typical way to, to maximize your score. Anyone see a good idea here? No? Not really, no. Um, well, the solution, I think, is uh, beautiful. Maven plays the very, very small word, we and awe. Awe is apparently an expression if something is, uh, is bad, right? The idea of it is that, well, again, if we look at optimizing your score, you will try to make much more point with some other words. But that's not what, uh, let's say, a, a game is about. It's behind with 73 points at this point. There is only one way of winning. This is creating the option of uh, making what is called a bingo on the next move. It has to use all its letters to get sort of a huge bonus score. This is the only chance it's got. Um, what it is doing is something that is called rollout, or we might call it Monte Carlo now. It's simply, it's not possible to calculate that far because, well, at that time at least, well, there's a lot of possibilities. You can see there's a lot of, you can make a lot of words here, then the opponent has to move, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually too complicated to sort of map that out completely. They started to use a technique called rollouts. It was, uh, I think, inspired by a guy called Ron Tickert, who was an expert um, Scrabble player, and he said that it's actually difficult to calculate in Scrabble. It's a better idea to actually test, uh, let's play this position 50 times and see who's actually, well, if we play it, who's gonna win more often. This is the, a better way than actually calculating here. And then they implemented this to the sort of Maven program and it could do it much more. And what it did here was basically, it plays a lot of simulations quickly, I, maybe only in the number of thousands because of the computer power at that point, but still. And then you can see, okay, all the, let's say, more promising, sort of visually promising things, they actually don't win. But hang on, 
if you play this Wii, suddenly it gives a 25% win in the, in the rollout position. And this is the best move. So basically it makes a lot of tests and comes up with a surprising uh, solution. Um, what it's going to hang on is basically you can see that there is this thing called, ah, if you go back here, unseen tiles. The point is that in Scrabble, if you play a letter, you ha have only, well, you have seven on your hand. When you play a letter, you have six, so you have to draw something from the tile, uh, from the back. And you can see there is, I think, nine letters left. And what it calculates is that if it's lucky and it gets a U, it has a chance to win the game. And that's exactly what happens. So it plays we. The opponent, as far as I remember, plays, I forgot what he played, also it doesn't matter. But what Maven has set itself up for is that it's calculated that it was possible to play the word mouth part if it got a U. So basically it calculated that my opponent doesn't have a good response. And what I can do is that if I'm lucky to get a U, which is two out of nine, I will actually win the game because I will just overtake him, you can see, by two points at the top. Um, this is very, very difficult for a human to do these kind of calculations, obviously. But for them, it's just, OK, we let the computer play a lot of games. We can see, ah, this one actually wins two out of nine times. This is the only chance I have, and then I do it. And uh, well, this was quite a shock for the player at that time, obviously. I spoke after last year's lesson. I went back and I spoke to the Danish champion in Scrabble, and he said, it's actually possible for a human to solve these kind of things. He, will, he would basically look at his hand up here and he will say, I have quite some, well, you can see this is my letters. These letters are quite useful. It's possible to make a, a long word with it, but the W is tricky. So I have to get rid of a bad letter in order to have some kind of chance. If this is sort of was known at the time, I don't know. I think they might have learned off the computer at that point. But this is sort of, um, well, it's a much more, you can see, mathematical and probability-based uh, way of playing Scrabble while we would just think in terms of word, as you said, we would think in terms of uh, dictionaries. Anyway, this was the Scrabble part. Um, I wanted to move to more complex uh, games. This has basically, now we have been in the, let's say, um, the compartment of the, the toy store, right? We've been there. Now we move to the much, much more complex and much more deeper games. Checkers, chess and go. Uh, I have written down the sort of mathematical complexity of the games. Well, you can see tic-tac-toe. Um, I guess you guys are more mathematically skilled than me, but I think this means thousand, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is sort of, um, well, the depth of the games, how many possibilities there is. Tic-tac-toe, I said, we could do by hand. Connect4 actually takes some kind of modern compute, and the others, you can see, gets much more complicated. Well, I think checkers, as we will see, it's possible to solve in some kind of brute force ways because it's still not impossible to, to reach that kind of depth with a computer. Chess, I think they say, is uh, there's more chess positions than there's atoms in the universe. I think something like that is the definition. And you can see Go is just on a completely different planet. It's much, much deeper and basically Go has been seen as we're never gonna solve it with computers. Anyway, we're gonna move in that direction. But just to give you some idea of the depth of the games and why they are very difficult to sort of um, do something about. Um, actually, we're going to start with chess here. I will try and tell you why is it so difficult for computers to um, play these kind of g games with depths. The main problem is, is what we call a horizontal problem. Um, this position we're looking at is extremely easy for me to explain as a human, but it's very sort of um, difficult for a computer to understand. Um, I don't know how many of you play chess. Oh, it's not that many. Anyway. Um, if we look at the position, it's true white has one more piece than black, but white has five pawns, black has three pawns, but black has a bishop, and a bishop is normally worth like three pawns. So black is uh, sort of close to, to winning in this position. This is a game, I think, against a computer called Fritz, and then Vichy Anand, who later became the, the world champion of chess. And, um, well, the computer is close to winning. A normal move would be to remove the bishop back and then try to, to win the a-pawn and such. Anyway, it's not so relevant for us. The computer is to move here. And the computer is thinking, hmm, why can't I just take the pawn on a2? And that's exactly what it does. And immediately, Alan put his rook back to d2. And uh, I think I was in this sort of playing hall when this happened in Frankfurt like 20 years ago. And you can see that the audience, they start laughing and smiling and such. And uh, now everybody thinks it's funny. Well, the computer has absolutely no idea what's happening. The point is, for a computer, this is extremely easy to understand. I'll try and explain it. So, Black has an extra bishop on b2, but this is defended by the rook on b8 and the rook on a2. 
And it's very easy for a human to see. There's nothing you can do about that, because if you move the rook from a2, we can just take his bishop on b2. If you move this rook on b8 away from the b line, we can just take the bishop on b2. And if the bishop on b2 moves, we can just take his rook on a2. The only thing black can do is to take his king and walk it to the other side to help the bishop. But as we have rooks on d2 and c2, there's no way he can cross that. It's an extremely simple thing for a human to do. But for a computer, we'll just think, I have an extra bishop. And he will keep calculating and calculating and think, ah, everything is great. And a lot of these things happened at that point. And you will see, you know, I mean, well, the audience, as I said, basically was laugh laughing or cheering for the human. And there will be, I mean, mistakes like that. And this is, well, it's incredibly difficult because we tell them that, well, black has more pieces. And it calculates longer and longer. It will always keep the extra bishop. But it cannot progress. And as I said, for a human, very easy. For a computer, quite a problem. So this was one of the things they had to solve. And a lot of things like this happened in the beginning. But actually, chess is a bit too, too complicated at the time. I think uh, if we go back to the 90s or something like this, that was, well, we're going to talk about checkers. Still chess, they had computers, but they were not that strong. Where they first made huge progress was in the game of checkers. As you can maybe see here, checkers is a simpler game than chess. Um, one thing is that you can see all the pieces aren't black squared. So while chess is played on 64 um, squares, checkers is only played on 32. Already that limits a lot. Secondly, checkers basically only have one kind of piece that goes in sort of, uh, well, two directions. And uh, they can promote and become a bigger piece. But still, as we saw, I think it, um, chess was 10 into 20. Sorry, checkers was 10. 10 into 20, and chess was 10 into 47. This is a much, much simpler game. And um, I think there was one guy who was sort of doing a lot of um, chess program, and he thought, why don't I do checkers? It's actually a much more reachable goal. And then at some point, there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, focus on that. Actually, this position is also one of these sort of trick positions that was hopeless for the computer. I don't know if any of you plays uh, checkers and know the rules. But the point is that, well, black has four pieces here, and it looks fantastic, even he has sort of managed to promote this one to what I think is called a, a queen. The point is that if you move, for instance, this one over here, here, then you can jump and jump and take the next two. If you move this one here, all these pieces are completely blocked. And if you move well, this one here, again, this one can take and take both. Again, for a trained human, it's very easy to see that these pieces for black are just completely dead. But again, at the time, this was too difficult for the computers. And this, again, this is what happened. That will be human standing and okay, looking. This uh, idiot computer has absolutely no idea what it's doing. This is very, very hard to program. And uh, well, that was kind of the challenge. Anyway, the match I will talk about first is this one into checkers. This is, uh, I think, uh, a scientist called uh, Jonathan Schaeffer, who I mentioned before was a chess programmer, but I thought, Actually, I'm going to put all my energy into checkers because it might be possible to beat the human champion. And the human champion is the one sitting on the right. He's called Marian Tinsley, uh, I think a, a Dutch, um, well, I would say grandmaster. I don't know if they had the title there. But basically, the world champion of checkers and has been completely um, the best player in, I think, a 20-year period. Again, if you look at, for instance, chess, you will see a lot of young players dominating the game. Checkers is a sort of non-professional game, basically. And uh, well, there will be people who have played it the whole line for hobbies and such. Uh, I think he was actually working as a priest, uh, for instance. But he was by far known as the best player. And I think he has lost maybe like very few games his whole career. And uh, they tried to build a computer game to beat him. In the beginning, they were not very successful. But then they got sort of much stronger at it. The way they will attack a game like checkers is basically from two sides. Um, we have the opening phase and the end game, where there is sort of either you can see this is the starting position, or you can see the, the finishing position where one of the players has won. And then you try to map out from both sides. From the opening, well, it's like in other games. Well, for instance, that is my job in chess. We, we have huge databases with uh, games by professionals. We try to analyze it with computers, etc., And you try to map it out from the starting position as far as you can into the game. And then you can do it from the other side as well. You have the sort of end positions, and you try to work your way into sort of the game. What they, for instance, did was they tried to make, well, they basically tried to map out if there's only eight pieces left on the board, is it possible to completely map out all the positions mathematically and put them into the game? And then they will have, um, again, they would have universities actually helping them with all their spare computer power. So basically, I think for years, 
at some university, whenever the computers were not working full times, they will be mapping out specific areas of the checkers just to help this project, for instance. So this is, I mean, it's not a commercial product, it's typically driven by universities like, like yours. And then they will speak to, let's say, top professionals in the opening and try to say, can you help us with the opening? And they will have the computer program evaluate all these kind of positions and then somehow get to that. The problem is that, well, between the opening and the end, there is something in the middle. And this is very difficult, and that's where human intuition is, is very, very strong. Um, what they tried to do was to sort of um, teach it to understand things. And this they did with having a lot of human input for and numeric values. And this is sort of an, an example of how Chinook, the, the computer program was called, is thinking. So basically, you can see that it evaluates a position by a number of things. Well, material is simple. I think uh, 70 indicates that it has one piece more. But then it has a lot of other things that it tries to give some values. I mean, trap, duck hole, turn, whatever. It's, uh, I don't understand the game of checkers that well, but you can see that, well, this is a lot of estimates and such. And um, at least I know from chess, sometimes this thing is important, sometimes it's not, and human intuition will be much stronger there. And this is, well, where the computers are, at that point, very, very weak. Um, they managed to sort of build it to a level that they only lost the first match by a kind of marginal score. Uh, but Tinsley thought, thought, actually, this is great. If you understand, Tinsley, he's spent his whole life playing uh, checkers. And, well, you'll see later, a lot of players facing the computer got completely freaked out. For him, he said, it was the best thing that ever happened to him because he was acknowledged as the completely best player in checkers ever. So when people would play him, they would be extremely afraid and they would just try to make a draw, which is kind of possible in checkers. But when he played the computer, he said, I'm actually playing someone who is playing interesting against me, who is not afraid. For him, it was amazing to actually play someone who was uh, almost at, at his level. However, as you can see, he's um, not that young. And uh, the problem was that when they started the second match, he was actually diagnosed with severe illness and even uh, died relatively shortly afterwards. So it was that they built a computer pro program that could beat him has never really been proven. Or the program, I thought, okay, I have to build a program that could beat him. Now he's not here anymore. What can I do? Well, I'm going to build a program that's just perfect. That's the only way I can actually show, well, I could have beaten him. Anyway, that's going to take 18 years, so that will be a couple of slides later. <laughs> I think here, yeah. We're going to move a bit to chess, I mean, um, and talk about the implications for chess, um, especially, well, here, the problem with sort of, let's say, Computers is that they get very strong and um, which kind of implication it has on the games. It's an interesting tool and that we'll talk a bit about later. The problem is also that they become cheating. I mean, as I said, in checkers, they're very welcome to com in, uh, computers. In chess, it's been quite the difference. We have been quite kind of uh, skeptical about it, I would say. Um, cheating is heavily one of the problems. For instance, um, well, you would think maybe I'm the best chess player in the room, but I'm very much not at all. You all have a mobile phone. It's not gonna be just better than me, it's better than the world champion. Um, you can just download an, an app, for instance, called Stockfish, and it's gonna be just much, much uh, better than even the world champion. And the problem is that, well, I just played, for instance, as, as Stefan noted, I played the Bundesliga in Germany. Um, we have to be checked by metal detectors, basically. Uh, it's illegal to bring a mobile phone to the playing hall. They will have random checks where they actually strip people and such, simply because we are afraid of uh, cheating. It's, well, and there has been people caught and, uh, and such. Well, this is a sort of simplistic kind of way. And uh, in the beginning, also, people were cheating, at least in an unintelligent way, and they got caught. This position here is a, is a classic. Um, I think it's in a German tournament with someone called Alvermann. We have never heard of him before or since, but he actually won the tournament. But he had this position against a, a very strong grandmaster. Um, I don't know, any of you plays chess? What comes to mind when you look at this position? Well, the point is white has many more pieces. He has an extra rook and an extra knight. This is completely you know, enough to, to win easily and it will be normal to, to, to resign. I mean, uh, well, if any, I'm quite a stronger player than Stefan, but if he had white here, I would also resign. It's uh, completely hopeless, there's too many pieces. So the strong grandmaster looked at his opponent, Alvaman, and said, okay, I resign here. And Alvaman immediately said, sure, you are made in seven. And these people thought, I mean, no human can look at this position and say it's made in seven. They would look at that you have many more pieces. The problem is that 
well, Alva Man was obviously getting from some computer, and the computer will easily map out all possibilities seven moves ahead and say, whatever you do, it's made in seven. So basically, he just confessed to cheating because he was reading up what the compu uh, computer lines were, were saying. But I mean, uh, well, again, this is as unintel unintelligent cheating as it gets. It was obvious people have never seen him before. He says something like this. He actually got disqualified. But if you cheat on an intelligent way, it's extremely difficult to, to sort of detect nowadays. Um, in the Chess Olympiad in 2010, uh, the French team, or not the French team, but one player of the French team was later caught cheating, but only quite after the event. What they were doing was that, well, he's playing the event, and this event is broadcast online, so you can follow all the games. So, um, well, everybody can just look at the internet, they will see the, the actual chess games, and basically live, maybe with one second delay or something like that. Then someone would sit uh, in the offices of the French Chess Federation in, in, in Paris. He will look at the game, analyze it with the computer. So he would send, he, what he did was he sent an SMS to the team captain of the French team. Again, it's trivially done, and the, the team captain at that time was allowed to have a mobile while the players would not. Or maybe he would go outside the playing hall and check his mobile. The tricky part becomes, of course, so they sent the sort of cheating move to the team captain. He has to give it to his player. That's where it gets a bit difficult. But they thought of a genius system. A team match is four players against four players on the team. So this means there's eight players in total. But as you can see here, also a chessboard has eight squares in one direction, eight in another direction. So basically they used a code system to, um, to define which square. So let's say, let's say France is sitting here one, two, three, four, and the opponent is sitting there five, six, seven, eight. So if you want to signal A, H, or one, for instance, you stand, you, as the team's happen, you go here and you start thinking. So this means one. And then you go over here and you say, okay, this is F1. Like this, he would just signal to his player what he should do. And this, of course, is completely undetectable. Um, and, well, this guy from France, he won a gold medal. He won 5,000 euros. And, uh, you know, people thought, okay, he played a bit better than he normally did. But uh, nothing too bad. I wrote a newspaper column. I remember in my, I write a weekly newspaper column in Wigden, the reason, and I published one of his games. And I said, yeah, good, good game. But I didn't really think, okay, this guy is cheating. Then later, people started talking, and I think it ended up with one of them confessing and such. The eight years later, the court case is not finished. Um, he's, he has been stripped of his medal. He had to pay his 5,000 uh, fee back. But there was ongoing uh, court case in France, and uh, I think the, um, the prosecutor wants him nine months in prison, but maybe sort of on a suspended sentence. But it's actually a serious thing. And uh, well, this is what we face these days. I mean, I'm the coach of the world champion, and when they, for instance, go into a match, they have to be, again, checked with a metal detector. Um, in the recent World Championship, he had to play what's called a playoff. So he had to play four games the same day. He talks with me before the game, and uh, then he has to go through the metal detector all the time. There was like 10 minutes break be between the, the, sort of the first game and the second game in the tie break. But anyway, he's been out talking to me, who's another human. He is, in principle, dirty. He has to be metal detector checked again. And this is how it's going to be all the time now. I mean. In the recent, I think, European Championship on the 14, there was a player getting caught, et cetera, and such. It's, uh, well, it's completely infected our sport in that sense. This is sort of the negative impact of AI. Of course, also, it's made it very interesting. I mean, uh, well, my job is analyzing chess positions with the computer. I'm part of the, the team that prepares Magnus Carlsen for the World Championship, and we spent like two, three months maybe at training camps, various places, trying to map out all kind of, so let's say, sort of, um, well, details of, of, of opening preparations, and we do it with shut. So it has a lot of pluses, but unfortunately, also cheating becomes a huge option as soon as there is some money involved. Um, ah, now I'm actually jumping ahead. I wanted also to show this video. As long as I could keep on the pressure, ah. you know, forget game today game. I mean, Dimbo hasn't won a single game out of five because, again, game two I resigned when I could force a draw. Now, force a draw. Now, if somebody has another opinion, stand up and tell that the position was not a draw. Game two was resigned in a completely drawing position. Is it a correct statement? No, is it the correct? No, I just want, no, it's important. Is it the correct statement, Mr. Benjamin? Game two. Final position was draw. Now, very important. Now, it was recognized that Deep Blue made a bad mistake in a completely winning strategical position, blundered a perpetual check. This is actually, um, I'm going back to... Um, chess. This is the Kasparov against Deep Blue match. This is where 
I mean, this was a sensation at the time. The computer actually beat Kasparov a bit earlier than people have thought. And what he was doing there was a crappy video, unfortunately, but um, he was basically accusing them of cheating. He said, okay, I mean, well, there's something to his mind illogical had happened, and he started accusing them of, um, well, you know, this was not just a computer program, he was also getting human influence and such. I mean, these kind of things has created a lot of uh, paranoia in that sense. But, um, well, here I'm talking a bit about cheating. Also, there was a long period where they tried to beat chess, a sort of. Uh, chess was basically seen as the pinnacle of the game. I mean, if you look at the games, people, at least in the West, will think chess is the, well, they say the, the royal game. That's the game where you have to sort of, uh, well, this is where you can prove that uh, computers are actually, well, extremely powerful in a way. And I think IBM put a lot of resources into to beating Kasparov at some point and succeeded in the end on, on numerous ways, uh, uh, in, in numerous matches. Uh, and later, sort of, well, we started to playing with less computer power and I said now probably a mobile phone could, could do it and such. But at that point, it was uh, very much a research project in the sense that, well, we're talking about Deep Blue, uh, which is IBM. It's not a commercial uh, product in any way, but sort of a highly specialized machine and such. Nowadays, well, the best programs is just open source. You download them, you run them on a computer, you run them on the cloud, and they are ridiculously good. And this is sort of, uh, well, what we used to, to, to work with. Um, anyway, um, this is sort of, there you are building machines who can actually play against uh, humans. Then you tried it to take to, to the next level. We talked about uh, the game of checkers, where, I mean, it was, well, capable of playing at sort of human, absolute top human level, but taking it to the next sort of level they wanted to do, actually to solve a game. Um, solving a game of checkers, I think, was it maybe 10 to 20 is basically impossible mathematically, but they did it, as I said, to try to attack it from two, two angles. Um, what they have, I mean, Checkers is the most complicated game that we consider solved, but it's not solved in the sense that we saw with uh, um, Connect4, where you know all the possibilities. What they have proven is that Checkers is a draw. It means that, well, whatever you do, if the opponent responds correctly, the game is a draw. What they have done is that they have basic mathematic mathematical proof where they have shown that if you make the right moves from the beginning and you map it out with sort of the right moves from the end, they're going to meet at some point. And, uh, well, they have proven that there is a perfect strategy for both. That means it ends up in a draw like this. This is not a trivial matter. I mean, and as I said, this guy, when Tinsley died, he decided that, well, I have to be able to sort of play this game perfectly. This took 18 years. I think it was in 2000 and... Uh, Eight, probably, they came out with a suddenly, okay, we have actually solved this. But we're talking about universities putting in a ridiculous amount of computing power, simply mapping out every kind of corner of the game. And basically what they do is that, well, you take a position where you can see, okay, this game is over, one player has won. Then you go, but leading into this position, there is maybe 20 positions that could, with one move, get there. So then you put that, these 20 positions next, and you, you build a tree like this, and you keep building it, and then you build a tree from the other side, and at some point they will connect, and you make a mathematical proof. But sort of the computer power and the sort of the size of that is basically insane. But they did it also in order to, well, it's very interesting, at least from a sort of a scientific point of view, because when we talk about, for instance, chess, we take um, human intuition and such. Let me just see, yeah. I will try and explain it in this position. Let's say we actually have a conference about uh, this position, an academical conference. So what we would do is that I would bring in, let's say, Magnus Carlsen, he's the best chess player in the world, Kaspar, who is one of the best players historically. We will use the absolute best computer programs. Let's try and mimic what they would say. I mean, they will look at this position, they will try to think quite hard and such. And maybe Carlsen would say, maybe it's a draw, maybe it's winning, it's very, very close. And, uh, well, what we can see is easily this this bishop is giving check to the king, and if he takes it, there is bishop e6 check winning the queen and such. Well, this is extremely basic. The computer programs will try to calculate very far. Maybe in the same position like this, they could calculate 50 to 100 moves ahead, and they would say, it's very close, maybe white is winning, maybe it's not. And then we could imagine some random person saying, actually, uh, I have a different opinion about this uh, position. I think that um, if white plays well, in 328 moves, he will be able to play the move a5 and advance his pawn, and he's gonna be winning. This sounds completely insane, basically. 
there's only one problem with it. I mean, it basically, it's like saying that the Earth is flat or something like that. Uh, I mean, even even worse than that. It sounds, you know, there's no way this is going to be right. The problem is, it is right. It has been proven that basically they have mapped out any position existing in chess with seven uh, pieces, and they know exactly the result. So. Well, you can just look up in the database and say, okay, this is this, this is this is going to happen. And if you play it perfectly from both sides, in 328 moves, this pawn will advance and you have a winning position. Um, so basically, it gives again an idea of to which level we understand chess. We understand it reasonably well. And with sort of, as we will see with all kind of modern technology and AI, we understand it quite well. But when we suddenly start talking things we don't think we understand, but we know we have actual facts, it becomes very, very weird in the sense. I mean, basically, if you look at a game of chess for us humans, there's a lot of sort of, um, you know, uh, maybe this square is weak, this is uh, good, etc. A lot of human sort of understanding, and even computers will think like that to some extent. At the end of the day, it's basically, if you play a move, either it wins, it's a draw, or it loses. And, uh, well, this is a position like that. This we can actually map out, and suddenly it becomes just a mechanical thing and not a game, and it actually, well, give some very strange uh, results. It's also very interesting because we get this idea that, well, we think we understand it, but we don't understand it at the level of, let's say, yeah, God or mathematical position in that sense. So this they did with, um, with checkers. They basically mapped out huge areas like this. And it was very interesting because we basically had 200 years of checkers literature. Suddenly people would actually call this guy. Actually, we have been thinking about these things for 80 years. We're not sure, is it a winning or is it a draw? Is it just a second? I will just look it up here. Oh yeah, it wins. We suddenly start having facts to problems that we have really tried hard to, to solve for a very long time. And well, there was many positions like that. There is, for instance, in chess, there is some guys who such as, they're taking all positions, with, let's say rook and two pawns against the rook. And then they just try to look, is the positions where um, it's actually a disadvantage to, to, to move first. And then they look at, ah, there's actually a lot of things called where you can, you can see that and you can, you can check a variety of things and suddenly get new knowledge like that. And this is, uh, well, a lot of things have to be written, sim be written simply of this. And this guy spent 18 years as a pioneer trying to map out checkers. It's not important in sort of, because there are not that many plays checkers, but it was very interesting to compare human knowledge to actual facts of the level of God, basically, in that sense. Um, as I said in chess now, it exists, exists with uh, seven, uh, seven pieces. An interesting thing happened at the World Chess Championship match uh, between Magnus Carlsen and a player called Fabiano Caruana. Suddenly, a computer said, uh, I think game six was happening. Magnus Carlsen was sort of on the ropes defending. But, well, the position looked a bit complicated, but the computer suddenly said, okay, this is made in 36 moves, if I remember correctly. There was 11 pieces back at the, at the, at the, at the position at the point. But the point is the computer can calculate, okay, maybe this will ex be exchanged and it gets into a position with seven pieces, and there we know the facts. And this is also what they were doing, let's say, in, um, in, in checkers, but also in chess. We have this position with seven pieces, we know them for facts, then we try to have you know, more complex positions, we try to calculate all the way, so we get into seven pieces, and then we know the facts. So we don't try to you know, calculate to the end. We, we know that if we just get into, well, this, let's say, 18 gigabytes of position, we actually have a fact, so they can use this Instead of having to actually give checkmate, we just know that if we get into this position, we know this is checkmate in 300 moves. So we try to sort of combine, you know, a huge database of winning positions with calculations into that thing. And that's sort of, uh, well, in checkers, it leads to kind of magical results. And also, well, now it's used in, in, in chess uh, in that way. Um, what's the time? Okay. Um, this is basically, let's say, the simpler game in that sense, the things, the games where computers actually have um, beaten the humans. The next time we will, uh, sort of after the break, we will talk about basically the game of Go. Um, Go has been considered like the, you know, the pinnacle. It's impossible to touch it with artificial intelligence, basically. I mean, they have tried. They have made computer programs basically based on the same principles that we talked about now, chess, checkers, uh, scrapple, whatever, and they've come incredibly short. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just outside top 100 in chess now, but uh, even that, I would be much stronger than the Go programs used to, to be. For a professional player, they would normally toy with them. Normally, they would play with handicap, all kind of things. I mean, they were good amateur players, but nothing more than that. The point is that the games we talked about, let's say, well, chess especially. In chess, there's something called the king. 
basically the game is about if you kill the king, you win. In, Ch in, in Go, there is no king. Basically, it's about creating territory. If you can, let's say, well, if you look up in the corner here, black has some territory. If he controls it a bit better, he would, this would be his territory, and you'll get one point per territory. One point for each square you control, but white will also have some things to control. And while in chess, it's, there is only one main target attacking the king, then you can see in, in Go, well, you can have points here, you can have points here, you can have points everywhere. It's a much more about sharing, while in chess, there's a very clear target. And the clear target is brilliant for computers, because then you can try and calculate exactly after that one target, while in, uh, in Go, obviously, it's much more about intuition and such. And this meant, basically, it's been impossible to, to attack this game. Um, and I think the, the story we're going to talk about next is sort of, uh, well, this company called DeepMind. And uh, I think one of the owners said that he was at a, at a conference. And basically, he showed them a video. Let me say this one. It's about to start, I hope. Running. So let's see. Okay, it's a bit slow. It's a simple Atari game. You might have played it in your youth. beginning, the computer can basically not hit the ball. It's just sort of randomly trying out strategies. Then it's trained for two hours. Now it just plays what we would say like a, a genius. It just does everything correctly, it looks. Then they let it train a bit more. Well, what you saw first there, this is basically, well, it starts playing just randomly. It's uh, experimented, it can't hit the ball. Then it actually sees, ah, if I do like this, I get some points, and I, that stimulates it, then I'm doing something right. After two hours, it starts playing it like hitting the ball perfectly every time, but then it starts experimenting a bit and see, actually, if I dig a tunnel up like this, I'm getting much more point. It's basically, it's self-learning. This is a program that they wrote uh, at this company called DeepMind, who was at the time, I think, owned by, by Google. It's still, still owned by Google, sorry. Um, and it simply, they said, we've created a program that just by raw input, it can learn to play any Atari game at the superhuman level, basically like everything else. And the, oh, they showed this to one of the bosses, and he said, okay, can you do this? How long time will it take it to learn to play Go well? Sort of, Go is basically impossible, and I think one of them, by sort of mistake, just blurted out, I think, two years. And they said, okay. Let's give it a shot. And uh, well, that was basically, you can call some kind of Apollo project of that. I mean, uh, it's not supposed to be possible, but um, well, it was. Basically, it was considered impossible. This was something that's supposed to happen in the future or never happen uh, at, at all, actually, should we? Okay. Um, but they d decided to have a go at it. Well, that was actually an <laughs> unintended pun. I can't be the first to have made that. Anyway. Um, and uh, well, put up, I think in the beginning, like five people, but then later when things started progressing, they actually brought in a lot of very specialized computer guides. It's important to understand that those who were doing this are not good Go players themselves. I mean, they know the rules, they might be good a bit for sort of European standard, but um, the game of Go in Europe, um, well, we have some decent players, but um, nothing compares to Japan or Korea where they have been, and China where they have played it 
for centuries on a very, very sort of high level. So basically, we're not talking about expert in the game. We are just talking about someone who knows how to program and has thought a lot about doing these kind of things. Um, as we saw before, they were doing these kind of things with self-learning, but the game probably is called Breakout in Atari. Here, they were moderating it a bit, but basically, they were giving the computer a lot of top human games to study and to try and learn from. And it basically tried to build some kind, we would call it in chess, understanding. That basically, the program would have some kind of intuition where you could see, okay, if this is the position, then these are the typical moves that normally professionals will play there, they will play there. And then, well, they will try to teach the, let the program teach itself from getting the experience of looking at all these professional games, and it will start sort of um, playing against itself and trying to evolve from that. And basically it becomes like some kind of, um, well, you'll almost say from biology, like evolution, that, uh, I mean, you have some kind of, let's say, DNA, and that is the strongest. But then you basically, you create a mutation that challenges it. And then these two fight out against each other. And if the mutation actually turns out to be stronger than the previous DNA, well, then that sort of in weights uh, and uh, starts you know, defending its position against new mutations. So basically, you make the program stronger and stronger, just playing against itself, and then trying just to, well, the best, the best version will win. And you start building your understanding even higher and higher. Um, still, that didn't seem, well, or if that was enough to sort of um, you actually be the best Go player in the world seemed reasonably unlikely. So what they did was that they invited um, the best European player. And the best European player, well, obviously, of course, is a Chinese who's moved to, to Europe because uh, we're not that good in this. So they invited sort of the European champion to, to play the game. And, well, we're not going to see that in the movie, but I can sort of explain it. And, well, sure, I mean, again, some, some guys think they have made a program and some, you know, Europeans who doesn't understand the go game of Go, they invited us to, to beat their small computer program. So he went to the Google offices uh, expecting to completely crush this uh, machine. But actually he lost and he lost all the games, which was shocking and also for him, well, he goes over in history as the first who's actually lost to a computer in this game of Go. But, uh, well, he became an advisor and he became very interested in this. But at that point still it looked like, well, the program was good, but it beat the European champion, but as I stated, European champion means basically nothing. I mean, uh, well, I think Stefan mentioned that I'm the best shogi player in Denmark. This is a Japanese game that's played by millions of Japanese for many, many years. But in Europe, we are like a couple of thousand players. And while I, technically speaking, have what's called the, similar to the black belt of karate, I have the same dan grade in shogi, it means I'm a complete amateur. I went to Japan a couple of years ago, and I went to sort of the, the shogi club, and then I sit next to this sort of very tiny kid who's maybe 10 or 12 years old, and they come and say, no, no, he's much better than you. You have to get a, a huge handicap to play with him. And I played with him and lost. So, I mean, just give, gives an idea of how weak we actually are in Europe and these games that they've specialized in there. And Go is the same kind of things. The European champion is good, but not at the top level. So he lost to it, and they were basically ridiculing him. And he said that online that people were saying, okay, this guy moved to Europe. He forgot how to play. He has no clue and such. And uh, I was a bit tough for him, obviously. But uh, anyway, but then at this computer uh, sort of uh, artificial intelligence thing, they actually made a challenge to the best player in the world or the most renowned player was the Korean player called Lee Sidol, who accepted the challenge, also thinking that, well, not, not, a, not a big deal in, in any way. At that point, it was clear that the games, it has played against the European champion, but also the other professionals saw, and they thought, okay, this is gonna be very, very easy. He's gonna crush it. And uh, I was of the same opinion, uh, to be honest. I, well, I don't understand the game of uh, Go, so I couldn't evaluate the game, but I knew the complexity. So before this match was happening, I was really looking for bookmakers who would happily give me odds on betting on the match. Uh, luckily, um, I didn't manage because I lost a bunch of money. But basically, everybody was thinking in the gaming environment, this is way, way too early. Um, but, well, we were kind of wrong. Anyway, let's move on to see some movies as promised. We'll start here.
all the world gave the pressure to Li Zedong. Before this, he played the tournament for country, for himself. But this time, he played for the human. A bit of pressure, obviously, but still also. And again, go, well, again, we thought it's not big, but you get the idea there. A completely packed audience. I mean, this was an incredibly big thing in, uh, well, obviously in Korea, South Korea and uh, Japan and also China at the time. It was really supposed not to be happening and it became a sort of, well, out of uh, th this world event, basically. Um, well, yeah, we'll talk a bit about the expectations, but let's actually let the, the guys explain it themselves. So let's, let's jump to that. It's not exactly a small computer. You get the f also well. You get the feeling what it actually is they are against. I mean, you saw well. We're not talking about uh, a small computer. You see a whole team of very skilled, well, actually extremely skilled uh, computer scientists and such who has created this machine that a has this well understanding of based on million of professional games. Where is it most likely the human will play? Then they well then they have that as a sort of thing. Then they have also evolved on that and have it trained to play a lot by itself and have sort of you know, well, as I said, sort of basically versions playing against itself and letting the strongest survive all the time. So basically they have a bit like that. And then of course also they have something that's raw calculation. And all this they have sort of merged together. Even so, it still felt like that should be too early to sort of uh, beat the computer. You can see that if you look at all the experts, they think, well, this is basically a joke despite this kind of setup. It's a huge contrast to the chess world. I mean, maybe if you go, 25 years back, it would be similar. I mean, when I see someone, for instance, you can see, uh, maybe not here, but there will be a Korean professional saying that the best way to beat the computer is to complicate it as much as possible. It sounds completely insane to a, a chess guy because we are used to machines that can calculate, well, billions of moves, uh, not, I mean, billion of calculations means calculating way ahead. While for them, they, their game is so mathematically complicated that actually they have to get beyond this horizon, or that was the, 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 the thought at the time. But it's, uh, it's such a, I mean, for me, it's such a striking contrast to the chess world who would think that uh, 
you know, well, they simply speak a different language because for them this has not happened yet, while for us it happened uh, 20 years uh, before. So anyway, let's uh, get it in how it actually unfolds instead of my version. <laughs> I can feel his pain that, that he, he was he couldn't believe it. He, he couldn't accept it. He, it. It takes time for him to accept the, the outcome. Maybe Arthago is very strong now, but he don't want to believe maybe it. It's just go for the player. We we don't we can't believe it. Because boom for us. It's something very, very far. It's not something coming now. It's impossible. But reality is not. I think he designed in a very polite way. These are the police plans, but he provides no one. Oh, I think he resigned. Well, that was game one. Um, as you can see, they were completely in, in shock. And, but one from a game sort of thing, very interesting point. I don't know if you noted it, but at some point it said in the beginning, right, that he made a huge mistake. And they played a move that for a human looks insane. Um, well, again, maybe, ah, let me just jump back to my, um, well, basically, from a human point of view, we will not be able to calculate as exactly as it does. So you will try to, let's say, if you have a, a big lead, you say you're leading like 10 extra squares, which is called points, you will try to keep it in that direction and such, and you will maybe even try to enlarge that. What it did, it played a move, but it lost a lot of its territory. And for the, as you can see, the, I mean, the commentators, and the point is the commentators are the second best players in the world. The best one is playing, but the other one are complete experts as well. For them, it looks like just the most obvious mistake ever. But what the well, AlphaGo is saying that is, well, I'm playing this move, and yes, my lead is dropping from 20 points or 10 points to half a point, but I only need to win by half a point. And my statistics shows that if I play this, I'm assuring I'm gonna win by a very, very small margin. For a human, this is basically impossible. I mean, you can see how big the board is. I mean, you can see that the professional, they were standing there with their pencil, like counting one, two, three, four, five, six. For a computer, it's kind of different. And um, well, Basically, it's going to play something that's safe and good enough to win by a very small margin, while the others is not. And that, I think they say this is a, well, huge difference in a way, and also, I mean, well, a different way of, of thinking. And you can see that things that for the human, complete experts, and here we're talking experts on a much higher level than, than, than me, they think, wow, this is actually a big strategic blunder. The absolutely best player, which is the computer plays, and says, no, it's not. I mean, such a gap in uh, understanding is actually quite shocking, and that's very interesting because, well, as well you will see that um, our understanding of things that 
has only been understood by humans and it was extremely complex is now being enriched heavily like these things. Anyway, let's try and move on to the next batch of that. He's relaxing during the game outside with a cigarette.
this is a tough change for Mr. Lowe. And also, though, he's just not letting him leap over to do what he wants. Right. That has almost a kick point on this right now. That's not a good sign. Well, oh. Mr. Lowe just slapped me up on the side of the head. Oh, wow. I think Black's ahead at this point. Good, yeah. yeah, he'll lost that that one obviously. Let's move on to his apology. Mm -hmm. あの、now, at this point, he's actually lost the match 3-0, which, well, obviously is shocking, as you can see that all experts said 5-0 to him, or 4-1. But actually, um, the game of Go is quite different than chess. I mean, chess, you play for free results. You can win, you can make a draw, or you can lose. But because you can make a draw, it means that matches will be quite closer. And you can imagine that um, in, in Go, either he's better than the computer, and he might win 5-0. But now we've actually defined he seems to be worse than the, co the computer. So the logical result is that he would lose 5-0. And by, to, to the extent in this match, it looks like he's quite weaker than the computer. But um, the next thing that happens is very interesting in that sense of, at least it gives us some hope of, uh, let's say, human intuition and intelligence. I feel something look like the war, a weight in the forest through the winter. It's cold. It feels very, very cold. But I need to be patient. But the moment coming, we go out into attack. This is the end of the game. Oh, look at that. That's an exciting news. Look, Dave. Oh, he's on the wedge. Whoa. It's going to change. I do get the impression that Alpha Go is sort of 
That, that is basically a ridiculous performance, right? We have just seen that they have created something that can beat the best human 3-0. And then he actually managed to, to beat that. I mean, a week before we thought, okay, this would be trivial. But now we suddenly started understanding that they've built something that's much, much better than humans. And then he actually managed to outcalculate that. I mean, that is, uh, yeah, it, it's just insane. I, I can speak as a chess player. I understand that it's theoretically possible to have intuition going beyond a computer's calculation. But it's not going to happen, basically. Well, it happened uh, here. The, the technical team gives a short explanation how it's actually possible. So let's, let's try and hear that.
going to do celebration. Is that in the position that he played? That's when he played the back. So we thought this was one of the best options. Yeah. The value very low. So the god mate was literally a god mate because we believe that only one in 10,000 uh, humans would have found that. That's correct. And no one comes to mind is the top five in the top five moves. But yeah, that's basically what they're saying, right? That they think this is a completely unlikely move, while Foster Doll actually thought that this was the only chance in that position. That is, well, and well, you can see as also as they say that, well, you see that in the beginning. They evaluate this position as being winning for them. But when he plays this move and he cannot find a win, it indicates that, well, he's actually not winning at all. So there it's actually Sedol's intuition overruling this incredible Ma machine they have built. Um, I, I think it's just ridiculously impressive. Um, anyway, let's move on a bit to, oops, I think, what did the human actually learn? I think it starts here. Oh, alpha balloons are so weird and strange and basically mutate. But after a game is finished, we have to doubt <laughs> ourselves, our judgment. Alpha Bill making another kind of nonsensical throw in. I'm not really sure what that's about. This is what 10 or maybe 11 star play looks like. It looks weird, and we don't quite understand it. I think it is important to study more about AlphaGo's mistakes like moves. <laughs> and maybe we can adjust our knowledge of ourselves. To me, the most amazing thing to come out of my understanding of Go as a result of watching AlphaGo play are the, the infamous slack moves. Well, there's something strange about the way it's playing yeah. because it's playing some moves that are not really necessary. Right. A slack move is a move that looks lazy. You can see these other better moves, and AlphaGo is rejecting them. But what I think AlphaGo is teaching us is that we've been using score as a proxy for chance of winning. So the bigger my margin of territory, the more confident I am that I'm going to win. And Alpha goes saying, no, 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 it shouldn't matter how much you win by, you only need to win by a single point. Why should I be seizing all this extra territory when I don't need it? The lessons that AlphaGo is teaching us are going to influence how Go is played for the next thousand years. I'm afraid that's enough movies for today. Um, well, of course it has a huge impact Immediately, that um, that sort of well, go is beaten, and this sort of, uh, as I said, this was considered to happen much, much uh, later. It basically, I mean, well, also it became a huge news story, obviously first in uh, Korea and the other sort of go-inspired countries, but also the rest of the world. And um, and um, well, I think Musk, others, sort of was congratulating them, and also they basically considered that this is the kind of moon moon landing. I mean, um, in, in in AI that. Uh, of course, chess and such was generally nice, but Go is on a completely different level. And I think in the West, it's probably been underestimated a bit because we thought that chess is actually sort of the royal game. Chess is a complex and interesting game, but Go is, uh, as you can see, Go you had to attack with um, some very, very sophisticated stuff while chess was on a different level. Then they took the next step. You can see the picture here. I mean, this is a, a chess board and this is the Go board. And this is shogi. It's a Japanese kind of chess, um, more complex kind of chess, uh, I would say, and has uh, well bigger sort of uh, mathematical depth as well. Um, what they wanted to prove after the Alpha Go thing, as you remember, Alpha Go was partly self-learning, but also it had, let's say, input from uh, human uh, top professional games, millions of that it tried to learn from. What they wanted to do here was they wanted to prove that. This method is not something that just learned to play Go. This method is broader. It can be used on everything. Well, you saw it could be used to break out, but can it also be used on other complicated games. Secondly, they wanted to do, I think it's called tabula rasa, which means no knowledge. We start with a completely empty sh slate. So basically they thought we're gonna take the three most complicated games. We're gonna let our system play against itself and it has to improve and we'll see what level that leads it to. And uh, well, the result of that was what I referred to in the beginning of the lesson from uh, December uh, 2017. This is the most shocking ever. They did this and they created, by this method, it created the by far best program 
in Go, in Shogi, and in chess as well. I mean, the benchmark in Go was to beat their own program. And by sort of having it self-training for, I think, a couple of days, it managed to be much, much stronger than the one they had created with human knowledge. And this is quite interesting that, well, we want to put human knowledge into the program, but human knowledge will have a lot of biases. You see it in chess. I mean, we saw, for instance, with this uh, checkers program, right? We tried to put human sort of a piece is worth this numeric value, something else is worth that numeric value. This is our human expert knowledge, and it's the best humans in the world who's tried to help them. But it seems to be inexact. What they actually try to do is that we're going to do no human knowledge, just learn by, it, by ourselves. And it turned out to do it actually much more exact. Um, chess, well, they say it took four hours to teach it from knowing the rules to being better than Stockfish, which was the best human created program and the one I was using in London uh, that day. And I, I still use it actually. Um, so it took it four hours, but well, four hours is a bit of a fluid uh, thing. What they were doing in this four, four hours was that they had around, I think, 50,000 uh, TPU, which is kind of a, an advanced kind of uh, neural network computers. And they were working sort of together playing, well, training the network to get better and better at playing chess. I think after four hours, they were at the level of the best human created program. And when they meant more hours, it became even stronger. And uh, well, later we saw some, training games against the best human program, where they treated what we thought was absolutely the biggest authority in chess. Like I said, like Barcelona playing a, a mediocre team. It was beautiful goals, left, right and center. And some, I mean, amazing things. And chess had a level I thought was not possible to play, really like uh, aliens. And the same thing happened also in, in, in Shogi. It completely crushed uh, the existing program. And in, in, in Go, they managed to crush their, their, their own program. Um, what can we sort of learn from this and what's interesting? Well, um, for instance, what the programs create, you can see they have this learning curve. It's basically like uh, it's replaying human history to some extent. This position will probably not say you anything, but uh, this is called the Berlin defense. Um, up till the year 2000, the Berlin defense was considered like something that's, ah, it's pretty bad. It leads to a promising position for white, nothing to worry about. But in the year 2000 in uh, London, there was a, World Championship match between Gary Kasparov, the best player of uh, basically all time. He had to defend his title against the underdog, uh, Vladimir Kramnik. And Kramnik came up exactly with this defense and surprised Kasparov. It has some huge defensive values and Kasparov could not crack it. And since that point, it has basically stood the test of time. It seems that this is the most solid defense Black has. Why is that relevant? Well, the point is that Alpha Zero in his, in his own completely closed universe with no human input at all came to the same conclusion. This is the best defense there is for black. So this is extremely interesting, right? We have human history, evolution over a long period, ending up with this, this is how black should play. And then we have a completely sort of uh, other world, just an artificial world, coming up with a lot of openings, but ending up with the exactly same opening. Um, this is, of course, fascinating for us humans in the sense that, ah, actually, we got it right. We have found out the, the right opening. Of course, it's also very sad because it could mean that if the humans has come to the conclusion and the artificial intelligence independently has come to the same conclusion, maybe we have reached the end of the road. Maybe this is simply the best opening and we will never find anything to improve on that. That would be a bit sad. But, well, that, I, yeah, if I know something better, I'm not going to tell you. I, I, I do this for a living. So. <laughs> but in Go, there was a similar thing. Um, in Go, basically also, it was mimicking sort of, you could see that uh, human history that, well, it invented sort of the same, well, it's not called openings, it's called yosekis in a way. That sort of uh, yoseki, I think in Japanese means uh, sort of good play or sort of correct play in, in some specific way. And they basically found out the same thing as the humans, but then they saw actually, hang on, in the end, it started playing some things that was considered to be bad. And uh, this one is one example of this. Um, well, basically, there is this white stone, you can see there's only white. So basically this is on the sort of called the 4.4 point. It's defined by um, one, two, three, four in both directions. So this is considered the 4.4 point. And uh, well, it was known that it is possible for black to in weight on the 3.3 point, also the, the point diagonally left to it. But humans thought that that was basically not good because as you can see here, well, the black stones, it looks like it is controlling the corner, while the white stones, you remember the board is 19 times 9, 19. So the white stones are sort of hitting towards the center. And basically they thought that this is 
advantageous for, for, for Black to do it in that way. Um, and, you, well, it's very easy, for instance, you can go on some Wikipedia articles or the best uh, Go places and they say, yeah, this is good for white, and then there'll be sort of edit. AlphaGo played this in 2018, and, uh, well, now it's considered differently. And this is basically what happened, that um, Alpha, well, Alpha Zero playing Go had the same evolution but came up with this thing. And it's obvious that the, the top professionals, they had to reevaluate. They look at this computer playing itself, they can see it's actually doing things we considered completely wrong, it turns out to be right, and it really altered sort of the understanding of certain things. And then, uh, well, you can see, I think some top Chinese was very quickly to pick up on this, and now, well, you can just go online on the, uh, and buy books about the 3.3 free, free Alpha Zero innovation. That's basically something that, well, it has uh, simply improved on uh, human understanding in this sense. So, well, you can basically see them, they have played out sort of uh, evolution, and in Go, they went even further than humans and discovered new things. In chess, maybe also to some extent, but a bit more. Uh, then, um, I don't know how much time I have, let me see. Ah, we have a bit of time. Well, one can wonder how should we sort of push this technology to the limits. Um, well, as I said, these guys are not chess players or Go players. They are, well, they are a billion, uh, billion euro company working in, in London. I mean, they are using this technology to sort of create AI, and uh, I think their motto is first we solve intelligence, and when we do that, we solve everything else. They care about doing it, going into medicine to solve cancer, to solve all kinds of things. This was basically just an experiment in order to, um, well, to, to get better at, at AI. They're not sort of in it just for the chess. But for us, of course, in chess, it's interesting how much could we push this if we had the p possibility. Um, this position I have here is from the World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and uh, Fabiano Caruana. And I was the coach of uh, Magnus Carlsen, and this position happened two times. And with White, we have difficulties uh, figuring out what should we actually do here. Well, we didn't succeed that well. And, uh, well, we are, well, we had me who was in London, we had four other trainers who was positioned in Thailand because the, that fitted better with the time zone, so they could work uh, all, all day in daylight, daylight on the better conditions, etc. But that was sort of the creative team we had. And of course, we had access to very powerful computers, but we didn't have access to Alpha Zero. It would, of course, be interesting to have access to Alpha Zero, but let's say we had resources on the level of a state. I mean, this was a Norwegian playing a, uh, um, American, but let's say a Russian or a Chinese, maybe actually the state would care enough to give them access to a ridiculous amount of computers. I mean, if I could, I would put 50,000 computers to do this neural network thing. And instead of starting with the actual position, you know, chess starts from the first position, but from the first position can go in many directions. And of course, well, one position will lead to turn its weight in one direction, one would turn to, to its other. And this will be more, of course, inexact. Why not build a computer that only starts from this position? Because then it will exactly fit it to my needs. What I mean is that, well, of course, Alpha Zero created from scratch in the beginning position will be, as we know, a ridiculously good com uh, chess computer but we can make it even better if we, let's say, build an alpha zero from every possible position, because then it starts putting its weights only to this position and not to, you know, much broader. I mean, that would be great. The problem is that, uh, well, 50,000 computers probably cost, I don't know, a couple of millions an hour, and uh, the price fund for, for winning the match is, is smaller than that. So it doesn't make financially sense. But, um, well, I spoke a bit with them. Uh, those who actually have the, made the program, they said, let's say, if we were challenged to, um, a game, let's say, by another planet about the existence. We could push the limits of this to much, much bigger extents. Uh, it's simply not the game they're in, and, and uh, they don't uh, care about that. But for us, it's very interesting, and a lot of things are happening at the moment. Um, one thing is, uh, well, basically this. Yeah, it doesn't say you anything, obviously. But um, that, well, this Alpha Zero, they're not so much into chess. But, and they haven't, they released an academical paper where they showed this is the techniques we are using. Have a look at them, but I didn't sort of give the actual alpha zero file. Um, so, well, people thought, okay, what are we gonna do? No one can really afford 50,000 um, uh, TPUs by themselves, of course. So they've made an open source project called Leela Zero, which is basically everyone around the world, they put computer p power there, and then they start training. And it hasn't reached alpha zero level yet, but it's basically reached the level of other um, sort of this stockfish I talked about, which is, a, I mean, different structure. 
Stockfish is calculations, Leela Zero is more understanding. I mean, they have a match recently, you can say Stockfish is making billions of calculations. This one is completely different, it's like Alpha Zero. It's actually by self-training, learned to play chess. It's only cal calculating millions of moves, so there's a huge difference there. Also, Stockfish is like three megabytes, this one is 300 megabytes. So they're actually trying to train itself to teach it to play chess, and it's actually creating basically intuition, as you saw with uh, Lee Sedol. He got this feeling, I'm not playing a computer, I'm actually playing something that has some kind of creative force. And it's a very, very interesting technology for us to, to work with. It plays much more human, and it has a much, much better intuition. What we do, of course, is that we work with both programs. So we have one that can calculate incredibly far, and then we have this intuition, and we sort of use them as tools as we combine, and it becomes very, very, very interesting. But this is sort of um, what they are, are doing um, at, at the moment and such. Um, okay, then I will thank you all for, for listening and good <laughs> peace and order.